So if you look at private non-financial sector debt, it's been a while since I've looked at the Fed's Z1, but it's something around 95 trillion. Okay. So I don't even know what the Fed's balance sheet is. I haven't paid that much attention to it, but, um, but long story short, it's no longer, it, it's not even close to 95 trillion. So literally, if the entire private sector debt were to default and the public sector debt was going to replace it, i.e. The, the Fed was going to expand its balance sheet to replace it just to keep the total amount of credit in the economy flat, the Fed could have a $95 trillion balance sheet. And we're not there yet. Okay. But see, this is why, mm -hmm. the, the, why I phrased it as one of the most interesting questions is why hasn't the dollar collapsed yet? Because the Austrians will scream, and, and they did at the time, the moment that the U.S. went off the gold standard, dollar collapsed, dollar collapsed, dollar collapsed, and, ha and it hasn't happened. Why? Because we actually had, we were bequeathed a tremendous balance sheet by our ancestors. And we had an, an equity financed economy up until 1968 in the United States. And frankly, most of the rest of the world, because uh, most of the rest of the world falls, follows the dollar and follows the U.S. standard, whether explicitly or implicitly. And so, you know, it used to be that your grandfather gifted you a series double E savings bond um, in the 1950s. Now your grandparents are co-signing on your credit card. Okay. So we went from, we, you know, when you come of age, we went from having, from, from being gifted assets to being gifted debt. Um, and that's what's happening. And, and, and it's, it's just now part of everybody's capital structure. But the erosion of real wealth that is coming from that is staggering. And it, but it's been subtle and it's been happening over 50 years. Literally, I was born in 1969 and the U.S. flipped from an equity-based economy to a, a debt-financed economy in 1968. So my entire life has been during um, where we've been eating the seed corn, so to speak. We've been drawing down the equity of the United States. But that's why those who called for a collapse of the dollar when, when the U.S. went off the gold, gold standard in 1971 were, were wrong because we actually had a lot of equity capital that we could just draw down. And we've been drawing it down by borrowing, 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 borrowing. Um, and we will hit an insolvency in the U.S. at some point. So James is yeah. right. There is going to be a debt tsunami that is going to hit the insolvency at some point. But I think it's no, it, we're nowhere near as near as the, as the naysayers think we are. Now, that said, it could happen tomorrow because the financial system is that unstable. Wow. Um, and so, it, it, you know, we could have a, another 2008 and, and, and have a, a systemic issue that requires, you know, tens of trillions of dollars of, of printing by the Fed just to backfill for the default of private sector credit creation at that time. Um, and I think we all know intuitively it's coming. I, I do. And I think that could happen. I think it's quite realistic that a lot of the world is just done with the dollar as their reserve currency. currency. I th and I think that there's a lot of places that are, are willing to try something else. And, you know, one of my one of my scenarios and I don't think again, I don't think it's going to play out quickly, but like one of my wild case success scenarios for a digital asset is if countries start to realize that the U.S. dollar is not going to be the reserve currency forever. Other things are going to be the reserve currency. And and the same thing that we saw with banks, like people when, I, when we started selling software to banks, people would say to me, you know, why would a bank use something that like you guys were selling them when they could use something that was like made by banks? And what they didn't realize is that, you know, only like 10 banks in the country in the, on the planet are Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan Chase, like the ones who would build a system that the entire planet would run on. For the rest of the banks, that's 6,000 smaller banks, those are their biggest, strongest competitors. Those are the entities they hate the most. They would not want to use the system built and maintained by them because it's going to be biased in favor of them, their biggest and strongest competitors. And I think the same thing could happen to nations. Like every nation would love for their currency to be the world reserve currency. That's helped the U.S. You know, that's grown the U.S. economy, quote unquote, unfairly by leaps and bounds for decades. And every other country would be like, yeah, we'd like to have the world be the world's reserve currency. But the only countries that could possibly pull it off is the U.S. holding its position position, you know, maybe the EU, maybe Russia, you know, maybe maybe one or two others. But realistically, most countries know that if there's going to be a new world reserve currency that's a country's currency, it's not going to be them. And so they might actually prefer a currency that nobody can control to one that's controlled by their largest geopolitical rivals. And so that's like what I think is the biggest possible success scenario for for the for digital for you know for digital assets 
if these countries are like, okay, well, the U.S. dollar can't hold on forever, but it's not going to be our currency because no one's going to want to repeat the U.S. dollar. You know, nobody but the EU wants the EU to replace the dollar, right? Nobody but Russia wants the ruble to replace the dollar. Nobody but China wants the, you know, the yuan to replace the dollar. So maybe they could settle on a currency that nobody control could control rather than one controlled by their most powerful geopolitical rival. So if you want a success scenario, that's the one that I think is the most likely. But the money question is, how do you get everybody to agree? Well, I mean, they might agree on – they might agree if the alternative is that their geopolitical rivals force some new replacement for the dollar that, that's not – you know, that, that, that just – if they just replace you know, the old boss with a new boss. If the choice is no boss – you know, if that happens to make a bunch of cryptocurrency people rich, I don't think that's going to, they're going to see that as too much of a minus. To just give you just a high level on this. I go to a, a restaurant and I pay with my Visa card and they let me go and they don't call the police saying that I left without paying for my food. That's a payment. But I still have to pay my credit card bill and somebody still has to wire money to the restaurant, right, or ACH or whatever payment system they use. It has, the payment has not been settled. Traditionally, payment and settlement have been completely bifurcated into completely separate systems. SWIFT is a payment system that doesn't do anything with settlement. And the problem with that is it makes it hard to do a good payment because, like, you don't know if the recipient, you, you can't check the validity of the recipient. You don't know necessarily what the fees are going to be, what the exchange rate is going to be when the payment settles. So we built a system that, and the only reason they've been separated in institutional payments is historic. These systems date back from the old days when people had giant wheels of magnetic tape, and the tape was like on the bank's transaction computer during the day, and someone would physically carry it over to the settlement computer that talked to the other banks at night. And there was no way to settle during the day because the tape had to be on the computer that was handling the bank's transactions. It had to go to the settlement computer when it was done. Um, I'm not joking. I'm serious. If you if you you look at your glitzy like front end application for your bank, and it's all really cool, and you can access it on your phone, and it's all really you know. It's, it's 21st century, but you scratch just a couple of layers below the surface, and it's like you took a time machine. If you're lucky, you're in the, the mid, seven, mid to late 70s. Like, that's when these systems that plumb the movement of money were built, and they are breaking down. Make, make no, even if blockchain completely fails, even if all cryptocurrencies are a bust, the payment world is going to change because it's just it's, it's terrible. Um, I would tell you that outside of the U.S., you know, the SEC case you know, had almost no impact on our ability to get conversations and projects going with central banks. Um, you know, I know here in the US, we focus a lot on the US, you know, that's what you'd expect, but the reality is that the rest of the world does not see things the same way. I think it's, it's been clear for a while that countries like the UK and Switzerland and Japan have, have been very clear that XRP is not a security. So anyway, moving on to the CBC side, it's not really been a, a, an impediment. You know, since we started you know, two and a half years ago on this project, we We've announced five different countries that are working with us. We have a, you know, a similar number that are not announced, and then we have um, you know twenty plus other uh, active uh, discussions underway. So we've announced five different countries that are working with us. We have a, you know, a similar number that are not announced, and then we have um, you know twenty plus other uh, active uh, discussions underway. So. Once upon a time, the world of interbank payments was dominated by SWIFT, the global messaging network that connects banks and financial institutions. However, a new technology emerged, Ripple, and slowly but surely, it began to disrupt the industry. Ripple's blockchain-based platform allowed for near-instant and low-cost cross-border payments without the need for intermediaries. It also provided enhanced security and transparency, making it an attractive option for banks looking to improve their payment systems. As more and more banks began to adopt Ripple, its popularity grew, and it soon replaced SWIFT as the predominant interbank payment network. The benefits of Ripple's platform were simply too great to ignore. As Ripple became more widely adopted, the use of its digital asset XRP in the company's on-demand liquidity, ODL product, began to increase. ODL enables banks and financial institutions to use XRP as a bridge currency to facilitate cross-border payments, reducing the cost and time involved in such transactions. With banks using XRP and ODL, demand for the cryptocurrency increased, driving up its price. Institutions began buying XRP in large quantities to ensure they had enough liquidity to facilitate their payments. 
Investors also took notice, recognizing the potential of Ripple's technology to revolutionize the financial industry. They began buying up XRP in large volumes, causing its price to skyrocket even further. As Ripple continued to gain traction, it became clear that the financial industry would never be the same. The traditional methods of cross-border payments were being replaced by a faster, more efficient, and more secure system. In the end, Ripple's success led to a surge in the price of XRP, making it one of the most valuable cryptocurrencies on the market. The world of finance had been forever changed, thanks to the innovation of Ripple and the adoption of XRP in its ODL product.